Welcome back to Movies TV Mad. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. And a very warm welcome to Monday's edition of the DC Universe Daily. On today's show, we ask, what is the Flash movie? Then we talk about the Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice effect and we'll take a deep dive into this momentous campaign from the Snyderverse fandom trying to get the Snyderverse to continue over at Netflix. Some people shouting at me already, it belongs to WBD, it can't happen. Um, basically, I know who owns what more than you do and we will discuss that as well. But first we're asking, what is the Flash movie? Um, a long time ago, I had the great privilege, as some of you who watch my channel, and if you don't normally watch the channel, please subscribe. I would be very, very grateful and always very grateful for the support. But I did have the great privilege to go and see the Flash movie with a test screening. I do believe I saw one of the most fullest versions of the movie in terms of length. So it will be very interesting because apparently this movie is still unlocked. Um, it's kind of insane if it's still unlocked at this time. What they kept in that movie. But what is the Flash movie? What is the core message it's trying to tell within its story? The message is, is about not being able to let go. Barry Allen, a.k.a. Ezra Miller, isn't able to let go of his mother. When we first meet him in Zack Snyder's Justice League, he's still investigating his mother's death. Because he's trying to prove his father's innocence. And the whole story, when he goes to visit his father in that film, his father wants him to move on and let go. And Barry doesn't want to. So in this film, The Flash Movie, after having a conversation with Ben Affleck's Bruce Wayne, Barry is convinced to use his speed force to go back in time to change the fact that his mum is no longer alive, and he does this. So we know the story, he, brings her, he, he stops her from dying, and he changes the reality he's in. He's no longer in the reality of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman uh, and Cyborg and Aquaman and that reality where they, where they defeated Steppenwolf. Things are different now. He's created an alternate universe. He's not on Earth 2 or Earth 3. He's created another version of the Earth he's actually from. And it's very, under, it's very important that people understand that. So he's created an alternate Earth. He hasn't done this on purpose. He just tried to save somebody's life, his mother's. But by doing one thing, by changing one thing, he changes everything. So what happens is there's no Superman because Zod murdered him on Krypton as a baby. Now, of course, what Zod doesn't know, there's, a, a, there's another Kryptonian called Kara Zor-El who arrived on Earth instead of Kal-El, but she's been underground. She hasn't taken on her mantle as Supergirl, as she was supposed to, and she hasn't even seen the sunlight ever in her life. So basically, she's, as we've discussed in many videos, she is Flashpoint Superman. Basically, she's Flashpoint Supergirl for, for the subject of what we're discussing now. And so Zod and Fiora are invading the Earth like they did in Man of Steel. But this time they're fighting Supergirl. And they're fighting Michael Keaton's Batman. Because Michael Keaton's Batman is a thing in this universe. He's kind of, you know, an older, you know, messed up, bitter Batman. He's not the Michael Keaton Batman we remember. Basically... He's an alternate version of the Michael Keaton Batman. It's important that people understand this. So basically, he ain't really, he ain't really the Michael Keaton Batman from Batman 89 and Batman 92. So Batman and Batman Returns. He is a version of that, but he's not the version of that. 
So it's important to understand. So you've got Keaton's Batman, you know, versions of The Flash, all played by Ezra Miller fantastically well. Um, you know, fighting Zod and Feora, this time there is no Superman. Because in this alternate world, Zod murdered him as a baby. So that's the type of film you are, you are looking at. Now, is this film funny? Is it sad? Is it serious? Is it dark? Is it light? All of the mentioned above. It has a little bit of everything for everyone. Now, the comedy does come from Ezra Miller playing a multitude of versions of this character on this alternate Earth. And so you get a lot of funny moments, but you also get a lot of tragic moments, some devastating moments from this concept of Ezra Miller playing these different versions of Barry. Now, I have to say, despite the real world Ezra Miller and his conduct, I think very few actors could have pulled this off. This is how talented Ezra Miller is. He pulls off playing different versions of this character with flying colours. And I think this is not just something that I'm saying. Everyone who's seen the test screenings of the Flash movie has praised Ezra Miller's performance. He's literally in every scene of this movie from beginning, middle and end. And he pulls it off. So I'm not going to sit here and, and tell you that a film that I saw a test screening of is the best thing ever, the worst thing ever, a mid-movie. I think it's very difficult to tell what type of movie this actually will be when it's all been produced and, you know, the music and the VFX. When that's done, a very different movie. And I think when we experience it in movie theatres, it's going to be very, very interesting for someone like me who's already seen a portion of the movie, an unfinished portion of the movie, but I saw a lot of it, I, you know, a lot of it. And I was surprised how much of it I saw. So I wasn't really surprised by all the on-location pics of Sasha Cal Calais Supergirl suited up, Michael Keaton, you know, in the present day when Barry fixes Flashpoint. These are things I had already been, already seen, but kept really quiet about. But the thing is now I can be a bit more open about what I've seen because a lot of the stuff has been proven to be true and is already out there. And so I, I really liked what I saw. And as I said last week, and I think what I'm going to do is do a flash video once a week so we can talk about this movie because it's a big part of this year's movie releases. And it's probably the most important movie from the DC releases coming this year. Because we've got an interesting time. We've got four movies this year. Now, is it next year or 2024 when the Joker movie will be released? Is it 2024 the Joker movie's coming out? That's next year. I just forgot. I just forgot we're in 2023. That's so funny. So, yeah, the Joker movie is apparently, is it 2024? It's coming out, I think. Now, in terms of the Batman sequel, I can't see it coming out next year. So next year, we could actually just have Joker and the Penguin series, unless the Penguin series comes out later this year. I mean, they're just about to start shooting the Penguin series as we speak right now. So next year could be a dead year. So when James Gunn makes his announcements, I think you should expect 2025 is the year to expect his stuff to basically be released either on, either on HBO Max or through theatres. So I think next year could be a pretty dead year apart from Joker for DC. But this year um, is a huge year and I think the Flash movie is a huge movie. So the movie is about being able to let go. And, you know, Barry coming to terms with his reality. You see, he has to accept his mother's death. He has to. And by changing that one thing, he creates a nightmare scenario. So in terms of storytelling, it is about letting go and not being able to let go. I think that element of it is very, very well done and well executed. Now, Christina Hodgson, 
has written this movie. Now, I don't know if someone else has messed about with the movie, corrected what she's done. Now, Walter Armada was a big fan of Christina Hodgson writing stuff. I don't think she did a terrible job of writing this movie. I don't think she's definitely not my top choice to be writing a CBM. When I think of Birds of Prey, that wasn't my type of movie. Didn't really work for me. I don't think the writing was bad or the dialogue was bad and there were some funny moments. So I don't think she, you know, I think Bumblebee she did a pretty good job with as well. But she's not someone who should be writing peak DC. There's no question about that. There are better writers out there. So I think she did a good, I'd say a good but not great job at writing the Flash movie. But Andy Machete is the one who's really gone through the mill since he called First Called Action on this movie and he's slightly trying to promote the movie via his Instagram. Now he posted some kind of lightning bolt thingy uh, yesterday then he deleted uh, his gram so not his whole account just that post. Uh, so he's starting the teasing as well which is exciting. It's about time too because it's only June they really need to start promoting the shit out of this movie get people hyped. I mean, even when you look at Shazam, where's the hype for Shazam Fury of the Gods? We've had a trailer or two, we've had some posters, but I want to, you know, when are they going to be going around their tour? It's not, when are they going to start touring the world and promoting this movie? Because you know what? It isn't far away. I think it's out in March, right? Well, that's under a couple of months time. So they should really start going to work. So it's been a really long journey for Andy Machete, the director of the Flash movie, being tasked to reset up the DCEU. And now we're going down this different direction, and the big question will be, as we ask every week when we talk about the Flash movie and build up to the Flash movie, what does the Flash movie now mean for the future? Originally, it was going to remould the future of the DC Extended Universe. And now, instead of the DC Extended Universe, we're getting DC Universe. What is the difference between the DC Extended Universe and DC Universe? I would, um, I would boldly say not very much apart from a few changes. They always wanted to replace Cavill as Superman. That's coming. Ezra Miller's future is an interesting situation. Um, obviously, Hollywood is about money and reactions and I think if people like Ezra Miller in this movie that could give him a chance to continue his role. He's desperate to keep on playing this character. I noticed he is back on his Instagram as well. Beware Instagram and Facebook. Ezra Miller is back. Be afraid. Be very afraid. But he's back. So we'll see how the film does and you know for Andy Machete you do hope for success. I mean I always want all DC content to be successful, even if I don't like it. I never sit there if I hate something, wanting it not to be a success. I didn't want Birds of Prey to flop. But flop it did, and hard, no matter how they push it. And Birds of Prey really is an example of progressive Hollywood and what they attempt to do. Because Birds of Prey, Prey's fundamental story, is about toxic masculinity and how men take credit for women's work. Well, I don't know. Is, is that true? I don't know. I don't know. Have I, without noticing it, taken credit for a woman's work before? I don't know. I've probably taken credit for men's work before. I don't know about women's. Anyway, this is the fundamentalists making movies today. And they're not very well in the head, unfortunately. Yes, the inmates have taken over the asylum. So for me personally, I have a lot of excitement around the Flash movie and I can't wait to see the finished article. I think this could be a really special DC movie. The problem is for them is the reputation of Ezra Miller. It's like the same problem they've got with Amber Heard. How much will Ezra Miller hurt the Flash movie? That's a question that can only be answered once the movie is released. It will be very, very interesting because we all kind of thought that The Rock was bulletproof and popular 
and black, a Black Adam movie in DC would do well because of his involvement, and it didn't happen. Because the truth is, The Rock is a bit of an Arthur Daly and the Del Boy, and if you don't know who those, you know, hokey, uh, great British characters are, they're a couple of con artists, and that is what The Rock is. Apparently now, he's trying to find a, a path back to WWE. How embarrassing, at his age, it really means this guy is done in Hollywood, and that's exactly what that means. So, Andy Machete has been working hard. Andy Machete is a really, really great director. And I hope that this move, it's difficult now because this move, this was a big gig for Andy Machete. He was leading the movie, directing the movie that was going to change the DCEU. He was probably going to direct the next Justice League movie. He was probably, got, maybe even get Superman and Supergirl. He was going to be doing a lot. And all of a sudden, James Gunn and Saffron have taken over. And now he's in a position of directing a movie that may not even matter anymore. But money changes everything in business. So if the Flash movie does really, really well, Andy Machete will be able to cling on with the future of DC Universe. And so I think there will be something there for him if he does well. Because we still don't know who's going to direct James Gunn's Superman movie. Will it be James writing and directing it? Or does Andy Machete have an opportunity um, to actually direct that movie? It'll be interesting to see what happens. Because, you know, does, does James even have the time to also direct a Superman movie? He knows how huge the Superman movie is. But does he have tech, the technical ability to direct a Superman movie? Now, Christopher Nolan, who co-wrote Man of Steel, admitted he didn't have the technical ability to actually direct a Superman movie. Now, Nolan didn't even go to film school. He learned everything he knew about directing from, from himself. I don't know how he did it, but he didn't really study how to make films. He didn't know where to point the camera. He worked it out for himself. And, you know, Christopher Nolan is a great success story when you think about it. Not really a big part of the industry prior to his involvement. Got involved with indie films, but clearly had the talent. What Christopher Nolan tells, perspective, young, you know, filmmakers, you don't have to know everything. You know, you can learn how to do the basics as long as you've got a vision. You can be a great storyteller. And that's what we're losing in the industry today. We're not getting more Christopher Nolans in the industry. So I support Andy Machete and his Flash movie. I'm excited about it. And that is what the Flash movie is, my friends. Now, I've left several things out of the movie. Let's see if some of the secrets that are being kept will be kept until the release of the movie. But a great performance by Ezra Miller. A really, really good movie with a good message. Uh, Sasha Calais is great. Uh, Supergirl Keaton is great as Bruce Wayne. And Batman, there's a lot of cameos in the film. It's certainly a film to go and see. Whether or not people will be willing to support the movie with, with all of Ezra Miller's real world conduct, we'll have to wait and see. Now, moving on, there's a brand new Snyderverse hashtag going on, which is sell the Snyderverse to Netflix. We discussed this a little bit yesterday, but I want to discuss the Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice effect. What do I mean by that? The effect. That movie was hugely divisive and it sealed the Snyderverse's fate early on. From that moment on and the reaction to the Suicide Squad movie from David Ayer, that wasn't from David Ayer because they tampered with it, they were already planning to move away from the Snyderverse. And it was all about the Batman versus Superman Dawn of Justice effect. A hugely divisive, controversial movie. Some people call it a financial flop. It wasn't a financial flop. Neither was Man of Steel. They just didn't make the money the studio wanted from them. For me, um, especially Batman vs Superman, and I adore Man of Steel, it's on my list of top four DC movies of all time. But I think with Batman vs Superman, 
the principles, the storytelling, um, the commentary it's making on today's world is amazing. When you think about the things that have happened since Batman versus Superman in the real world, Zack Snyder is a bit, you know, is, is a bit of a fortune teller, if you like, especially the explosion of the Capitol building when we know what happened with the Trump supporters when he lost the election. You know, some real world things, but also in the Batman versus Superman movie, it actually predicted the hatred for the film. Superman is hated as much in BVS as, as the film is in real life. It's amazing to think that Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice is one of the most maligned, controversial movies of all time. When we have lists of movies like JFK by Oliver Stone and The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. Oliver Stone's JFK, one of my favourite films of all time, gives you evidence that John F. Kennedy was assassinated due to a conspiracy and not by one lone crazy um, nut shooting the president. And he had evidence in this movie and delivered it beautifully. Hugely controversial film. The star Kevin Costner and the director Oliver Stone had multiple death threats. Then you've got Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, which basically makes a really huge claim that the Jews were the ones who ordered the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about who runs Hollywood, and you know, you've made a film in Hollywood, there's only one way this is going to go. A hugely controversial moment. There's no, there's no films more controversial to me than um, JFK and, and The Passion of the Christ. And Little Batman versus Superman is no way as as controversial as those movies. But there you have it. There, there you have it. it Batman vs Superman by Gen Z is deemed one of the most controversial movies of all time. And that's what destroyed any chance Zack had of making more of his DCEU movies. And for me, it's a big, cha it's, it's a big shame. Because I think Man of Steel Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice and the Snyder Cut are probably three of the best CBMs made in recent history. I think they're superior to any Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. They are the themes, the messages, the way they look, everything. They're such, they're, they're such great, well-made movies. And I think the only DC movie that, that can really compete to any of those movies, I'd say Joker is a great CBM. And also I'd say that I, th I think visually the only movie that can compete with Snyder's trilogy is James Wan's Aquaman. And I think James did kind of consult a lot with Zack Snyder while he was making that movie. But I'd say Aquaman is the only one visually as stunning as anything Zack's ever done. So I love the Snyder movies and there's a campaign to get these movies or the continuation of these movies on Netflix. And, you know, lots of people saying, well, Warner Brothers Discovery own DC Comics. It's not possible. Right now, not just WB, but many studios, I've just seen AMC cancel something and try and sell it off, an animated series. So they're all doing it now. They're grabbing their stuff off of streaming and they're trying to sell it off to others because Hollywood, the Hollywood studios tried to compete with Netflix and they failed and now they're probably going to try and sell all their shit off to Netflix. So Netflix, it, everything really worked out for Netflix in the end, if you look at it that way. <laughs> but so I do think there is a reality, a good chance of the Snyderverse being continued over on Netflix. He's already with Netflix. He's already got a contract with Netflix. Netflix are extremely happy with him. Now I think Rebel Moon and its sequel will be very important if Netflix would want to do this because Rebel Moon would have to be significantly successful for Netflix I think because Netflix have really invested a huge amount of money in Zack with the zombie stuff but Rebel Moon and its sequel are not cheap. You know they've been you know when Zack Snyder makes stuff it costs money 
because Zack Snyder uses the best people and the best tech. It, it, there's no question about that. Now, I can't wait to see Rebel Moon, and I do feel Rebel Moon is something different and vast and exciting that today's audiences are desperate to see. And I think both movies will be successful. If they are, I think Netflix would seriously, if like, if they, you know, if Zach allows some test screeners to see Rebel Moon and, you know, the feedback's really good, I think Netflix could be persuaded to do a deal with WB to lease out the DC copyright so they can continue Zach's DCEU. So what would, what would um, Zaslav need to be convinced to be doing this? I don't think Zaslav needs to be convinced to be doing this. I think he wants to do this. He needs to raise three billion dollars. He's desperate and this will be a great way of raising that money. But how would it work? Well, the investment from WB would be very little. They would be paying, look, I think in terms of budgets, Netflix would be paying 75% and maybe WBD, Warner Brothers Discovery, would kind of invest the rest of it, a quarter of it. But because Warner Brothers Discovery own DC Comics, no matter how little they invest, they get half of the profits. And Netflix would get the other half, maybe slightly less than half. This would be a profitable venture. This is not something that's going to be released uh, via general release in movie theatres. This will probably have, you know, be in a few theatres, but then be on Netflix, like, like they did with Glass Onion, of course. And so the kind of amount of money it needs to make is different on Netflix than it would be in cinemas. And nobody really is ever going to know how many people watched it because it's on Netflix. But the point is, Netflix would profit from this a lot. Zack Snyder is a huge director. Netflix are working with a lot of huge directors like Ryan Johnson. The Glass Onion thing has really worked out for them. You know, they've been working with Del Toro with the fabulous Pinocchio movie that he did. They're working with huge directors. Huge directors want to work with Netflix and other streamers because they get freedom of creativity. So this, my friends, would be the perfect scenario for Netflix and for the Snyder fans. I'm a Snyder fan as well, but I am a DC fan in general. And I think you all understand that by now. I'm not just here for Zach, but I love him. I think he's great. And I'm going to help you fight for this to get Netflix to produce the continuation of the DCEU Snyderverse via my channel. Now, I don't have a huge following. You can see my stats on my channel. There's no hiding it. I get around, what, 50, 60 views a video, if I'm lucky, with about six likes. So it's not like I'm very, very popular. But I'm going to do what I can via my platform. So next month, I think it's next month, the Snyderverse fandom are going to have a trending event. Hashtag, sell the Snyderverse to Netflix. I will be supporting this. I think it's a brilliant idea. And I think what Snyder, I love the Snyder fans because... They are thinkers. They are very, very clever people. They realise the fire James Gunn hashtag, even though they've done hugely well out of it, isn't going to get them what they want. They're not going to fire James Gunn. It isn't going to work. It's futile. And now, now I feel, I feel the Snyderverse fans have heard something about maybe discussions between Zaslav and Netflix and something happening here. So I think this is, I believe this is a reality. So this trending event is a really big moment. I think it's like that moment in that November when we were not celebrating the anniversary of the release of Justice League, but we did a trending event and it had a trend of over a million. Gal was involved, um, Ben Affleck was involved. It was huge. It was amazing. It was great memories for us Snyderverse fans. And we got the Snyder Cut released. And thank fuck for that. A four hour Justice League movie, a beautiful, stunning compelling four-hour Justice League movie and I'm proud and privileged to have fought with all of you to get that done and I'm going to stand with you again because nothing would make me more happy to see the continuation of Zack's DCEU over on Netflix a platform that's available for me here in Cyprus the only streaming service American streaming service British streaming service that's actually legally available to me here in Cyprus Netflix is the best streamer 
it would be amazing, it would be exciting. And if these things work out, Zach can just keep on doing and doing this. And you know what? Does you know people say, well, does Zach really want this? He's doing Rebel Moon. Zach wants nothing more than to keep on making DC movies. Zach put everything into Man of Steel and BVS and the Snyder Cut, and they stabbed him in the back. He deserves to finish what he was doing. Not everyone deserves to finish what they were doing, right? But what he was doing was fucking amazing. And I want to see the natural conclusion of it. Basically, it's going to be separate to what Gunn and Saffron are doing over at WB. It will be at Netflix. It will be a total separate thing. And because Gunn's doing DC Universe, you know, instead of DCEU, that kind of makes things less confusing for the fans. So I think they're already in talks. I think a trending event will just help them see that this is a great move. I think there are negotiations. This is what Zaslav and other studios are doing now. Because, as I said, studios have failed with trying to make successful streaming services. They tried to destroy Netflix, and Netflix destroyed them just by continuing to do their thing. And long live Netflix. They're the ones that come up with this streaming idea. It's fucking brilliant, and they do it the best. So I think this is a reality. I think you're going to see this with a lot of content at Warner Brothers Discovery, not just DC. They're going to sell their souls to the devil because Warner Brothers Discovery have taken over a failing company that makes very few billion dollar releases. And that, my friends, is the reality of the situation. So yes, I'm fighting for this. I believe in this, but I'm also very intrigued to see what Gunn does with DC as well. Would it be amazing if Gunn succeeds, Snyder succeeds on Netflix with Rebel Moon, we get the Snyderverse on Netflix as well, and everybody's happy, and we don't have to be nasty to each other anymore. Wouldn't that be a beautiful world to live in? This has been Monday's edition of the DC Universe Daily with me, Mick, your host with the most just ask your girlfriends and your wife. Please like, share, comment, subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you never miss this beautiful perfection. And I'll see you again tomorrow. Until I see you again, goodbye, au revoir, au revoir.